Hi, and welcome to this week's From the Vault episode from the Magdalene House podcast. The Magdalene House is a recovery community for alcoholic women, known affectionately by many as Maggie's. We are a 501c3 nonprofit organization based in Dallas, Texas. In our From the Vault episodes, we share past podcast releases from our four podcast series, Recover Ed, Studying the Steps, Recovered Interviews with Alcoholic Women, and Hope for the Family. Our podcast aim to connect, inspire, and educate alcoholic women, loved ones, and the community to the Magdalene House and the services we offer. We're so glad you're here. Thanks for listening. So we have on Emily and Sue Ann. I think what we'll do first is, Emily, if you just give us like a, if, a brief synopsis of your story to give the listeners a little bit of background, and then we'll just go from there. Sure thing. And Stephanie, thank you so much for asking us to do this. This is an honor. It has sparked conversations uh, with me and Sue Ann that we've never talked about. So thank you. And my intention is to be helpful. So my name is Emily and I am an alcoholic. I will have nine years in October. My sobriety date is October 12th, 2013. I am a two times Maggie's girl. And before that, I went to two treatments prior to Maggie's. So four treatments together all in the year 2013. And that is what it took for me to get step one. That is what it took for me to understand that I'm going to drink no matter what, whether I want to or not, that I'm powerless. I'm 41 now. Um, My drinking didn't start getting weird until my mid-20s. Alcohol was fun and social in high school and in college. And then around 24, 25, 26, it got weird and it got weird fast. I had consequences like a lot of us do. That's not what makes me an alcoholic. I'm an alcoholic because I have a mental obsession and a physical allergy. Uh, I'm an only child. Yeah, that mother-daughter, single parent, only child uh, relationship, that can be complex, especially when you have a raging alcoholic in the picture. So, yeah. So, did I hear this right? Sue Ann, you were a single mom? Yes, Em's dad and I divorced when she was six years old in the first grade. And then he died very suddenly within months of our divorce being final. Wow. Uh, when Emily was seven years old. So that was a very traumatic. Uh, I can't, that's the understatement of the century. It, it was very traumatic. Yeah. Can I chime in? I don't want to be. Absolutely. No, I, rem- I, re- I remember it a little differently. I, I remember y'all splitting when I was four or five and then him passing in first grade. Not that That's it matters, true. but I, I yeah, just... We, we separated when you were four. The divorce was final when you were six. Yeah. So, yeah, Stephanie, he passed away. Um, he had leukemia. So it was fast and it was traumatic. Yeah. Well, I didn't know that about you. That My son's father died recently. So it's um, kind of like one of those things that we have and com- we have that story in common now, in a sense. So did not know that about you. Did that affect you growing up, Emily? Like, yes. <sighs> okay, when I tell my story, you know, in the rooms in front of women, I say, you know, I- yeah, my dad died when I was young. And that sucks. And it's not fair. It's not why I'm an alcoholic. Right. But what it did was give me a really good reason to be mad at God from a very young age. Mom got me in play therapy. I talk about my my play therapist, who was an ex-Dallas Cowboy cheerleader, um, because I fell apart. I absolutely fell apart. Mom, you say it was like six months after he died, right? Right. Yes. Just, um, it was bad like suicidal at seven, I wanted to be with my dad and I couldn't. Did you carry that resentment into your drinking? Like, I know like for me, like as a child, I've had, I had traumatic events and I used it as fuel to continue drinking. Uh, I don't know if I did consciously. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? 
Yeah, like, for sure. like by the time I was in my twenties, that wasn't on my mind. Oh, yeah. I have a dead dad. Let's, you know, put down a handle of vodka. I believe in therapy. And like, mm-hmm. I did, I did work on the grief and, you know, the trauma of it a lot. When I think about when Anne's dad died, you fell apart. Yeah. Whenever my close friends' fathers die, I tend to have yeah breakdowns. <laughs> I'm yes. not saying it's healthy, but it's like, it all comes back, you know? Exactly. Exactly. It just comes, it comes roaring back. Hmm. So yay therapy on top of AA. Yeah. Hey, I'm going to see my therapist on Saturday. Woo! So, yeah. It's fantastic. You know, sometimes we need professional help and the big book says that. So absolutely. Okay. Well then you had, you said your drinking didn't get weird until your 20s. Is that correct? That is correct. Miss Sue Ann, when did you start recognizing that Emily was drinking to excess? I realized when Emily was in college that she was binge drinking. Em has always been very social, ha- has a great ability to choose uh, friends that are good for her. Uh, she's always had excellent friends. And I I realized that a few of her friends were creating some distance between themselves and M. And M began, you know, talking about at the school where she went, it was called the drunk tank and the drunk know, trap. I, it's called the drunk trap. Okay. <laughs> okay. It's an, another T word. Stephanie, just, I'm sorry, I have to interrupt. It, it, it's a it's a brick patio between the two guy dorms. It's like on different levels. So when you're drunk, it's hard to maneuver in the dark. Oh. Okay. Sorry. Go ahead, Sue Ann. Sorry to interrupt. Anyway, that's, I, I realized that, that M was binge drinking and I didn't, I didn't really know what to do with that information. But I, you know, had certainly experimented with alcohol at, really at a younger age than Emily began her experimenting. And I am a master at denial. I mean, I am a black belt denier. So I just put that in the deny file and went on my merry way. So Emily, your mom got this information that you were drinking to excess and and going into the the drunk trap. Uh, (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Did she ever express concern to you about that or no? Um, Not that I remember. Actually, that's not true. Yeah, there was a, um, my freshman year, December, I had a little rough spell and and alcohol did come up. Okay, but in my mind, I'm in college, Mm -hmm. right? I'm a teenager or 20 or whatever. And it it was fun. It, it like it was fun. I wasn't drinking in secret. I wasn't hiding it. It it was a social lubricant and a party thing. And and I I, I wasn't drinking. Yes, I was benching. You know, like on weekends or like on nights where I didn't have an early class. You know, the next day. But um, I wasn't drinking alcoholically. I wasn't drinking against my will, mm. but yeah, maybe, maybe once my, that December of God, 99, 2000, she did express concern. So about. looking, looking back, do you think you had the physical allergy then? I could, I could stop. I could mm. stop and moderate then. Okay. Yeah. You, you know, in the book where it talks about like the four different stages, Mm-hmm. Like I I was like one going on two. So the listeners probably don't know the four different stages. So can you explain? Oh oh yeah, sure. Okay. Like stage one, this is in the chapter to wives, Um, you know, it's written in the thirties. So you can really apply it to anyone who is a loved one or a family member or friend of an alcoholic. So it's describing, okay, your husband might be stage one. So stage one is like, he's able to moderate or stop. And stage four is like, he drinks on the way home from the hospital. So just to give you like the different stages. So yeah, as far as college, I was not, I wasn't a stage four. I'll put it that way. So when she did express concern, you just, you didn't think that was anything to take seriously or? Nope, sure didn't. (laughs) Absolutely not. (laughs) Like, what, you want me to stop drinking while I'm in college? Like, it's not going to happen. 
Yeah. So then <laughs> when did you when did you, Emily, realize for the first time that your drinking was weird or not normal? Mid twenties. Mid twenties, I was working in the art world and I'm telling you, it, it got weird and it got weird quickly. I, I was doing stuff like while at work, um, before a opening or an art talk or something social, right? I would go to my car or go wherever I needed to go to take a shot of vodka or a sip of Chardonnay or whatever, just to kind of take the edge off so I could be, you know, charming and social and sell memberships and be the lady at the front desk. And that's all it was in the beginning, just one shot. And over the years that quickly escalated into <laughs> it makes me think of that part in the book, the, torna- the tornado that's that's ripping through everybody's life and leaving destruction. So that's when I knew there was an issue around 25. And Sue Ann, did you know that this stuff was going on? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Emily got pulled over and issued a DUI. I'm not sure. She was in her early 20s. 25. 25. Okay. I was 25. That's when I got really serious and said, I'm, you know, kiddo, you're, you're going down a rough road. I hope you're prepared for what's ahead of you because you're, you're in for it. If you don't make some changes, that's when I realized the severity. That's when I realized what I was up against in terms of Emily's drinking was when she got the DUI and then she began losing jobs. She couldn't hold it together and, um, you know, do do a work week. And what were you experiencing like as a mom watching your daughter go through that? How, you know, how did that feel? Horrible. That that felt really bad for me. And I was extremely frustrated because I was in therapy at the time. And I desperately needed someone who knew what they were talking about. And I I wasn't able to find that. I did go to an Al-Anon meeting, but it wasn't I, you know, I was a total newbie. I was very naive and it was explained to me at the beginning of this meeting that they were not a big book group. They were more of a just discussion group. And we watched an episode of Dr. Phil. (laughs) No, can you imagine? (laughs) And I thought, oh my God, get me out of here. If this, if this is what the community is offering for the family of an alcoholic, I'm, I'm in trouble. I'm in a lot of trouble. (laughs) So it took me a while to land in a place where I felt some support. Were you trying to help Emily while all this was going on? Uh, No, because Emily really wasn't helpable at that point. She, um, discounted anything that I might have to say. And she didn't want to comply with any of my rules to the degree that at one point uh, I kicked her out of the house. She, I told her she had to go find somewhere else to live, Mm -hmm. which was uh, terrifying to me because she didn't have a lot of money. And I, you know, I hoped and prayed that there would be friends and, and support people for her that would let her, you know, sleep on their sofa, that sort of thing. But I didn't know. I Mm -hmm. I did not know when I drew that line in the sand, I did not know what was going to happen. So you were scared? Oh, every day, every day. By this time, I was in a 12-step recovery program myself. And I don't know what would have happened to me or to my relationship with Emily, had I not had that support. Mm -hmm. You know, my, um, I work in the field. And before this, I worked for a transitional living facility. And instead of saying, kicking people out, we would say that their actions with, they asked us to leave with their actions. (laughs) So, (laughs) yeah. So it's like, 
these are the rules and if you don't follow them you're saying you don't want to live here is basic and I thought oh yeah that does make a lot of sense does it my mom never kicked me out of the house I asked her to leave with my actions so <laughs> yes I had a sponsor at this point I I spent some time attending meetings and finally I was so vocal uh, and asked so many questions. A very kind person finally said to me, Sue Ann, you need a sponsor. What you need is a sponsor. And um, that that hadn't occurred to me that a member of the family, you know, of an alcoholic could have a sponsor. I did not know that. So Mm -hmm. I got this sponsor that was, uh, man, she was rough. (laughs) She was she really made me toe the line and that that made a huge difference in my fear level and in my relationship with Emily. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, one of the things that I've heard parents say, you know, who are in the grips of their child's, you know, addiction or alcoholism, I can't kick them out. They'll have nowhere to go. They'll be on the street. So how were you able to get to a place like, because I'm like, I'm a mom, I'm a mother, but my kids are, are still young. I have so much respect for moms who have to go through this. I hope I don't ever have to. How did you get to the point where like you knew that allowing her to continue to stay with you would be more harmful than helpful? Well, I realized that allowing her to continue to live at home, that I was really enabling and harming her. That if if my goal was for Emily to function as a an adult, then she needed to get out of the house and go do that. Uh, mm-hmm. And it was it was terribly difficult, but I knew I knew I was doing the right thing. Can can I chime in? Absolutely. Sure. Can chime okay. In. I yeah, to- I remember my second treatment. It wasn't Maggie's, and there was like a visitation day, and my mother and my boyfriend ex boyfriend at the time came to visit me for an hour. It was summer 2013. And I remember my mom saying, so what's the plan when you get out? Where are you going to go? I remember, like, I remember it vividly. And I was like, uh, basically saying like, you, you're not coming home. So yeah. what's your, what's your plan? Was your plan to go back home before she said that? Probably. Yeah. You know, I didn't know I was, I was a mess. I was a mess, but you know, good for mom for setting a boundary and, taking care of her. So when she said that you weren't coming home, what was your thought process through all of that? Panic, probably. But I had a boyfriend in my life at the time, not for long, (laughs) but that would let me stay there uh, under certain conditions, which of course I didn't follow those either. So you told this story about how like whenever you called your mom and she said, but Emily, you're not an alcoholic. Do you, do you remember that? Do you remember that? Yes. Yes. Um, When was that? Was this before the first treatment or? Yes. It was before her very first treatment. She called me up and said, mom, I'm an alcoholic and I want to go to treatment. And I said, really? Why do you think you're an alcoholic? Well, she was working with this guy named Mitch, who has been a great friend to Emily. I'm so glad that he came about in Emily's life because he was a great friend to her. But he said to Emily, you're an alcoholic. And that's what she said to me. And I denied it. I said, Emily, you're not an alcoholic. We don't have alcoholism in our family. We're from a good family. (laughs) And I just denied it. I just said, you are not. You are not. If you're looking for an excuse, I'm not buying that one. You are not an alcoholic. That being said, she did pick me up and take me to treatment. Good. Twice. So... Were you thinking that there was something you must have done wrong as a, as a mom? Oh, yes. An emphatic yes. A hard yes. 
So what would you say to maybe a mom who might be listening, who's thinking that it must have been something that they did, or maybe they could have done something differently? Well, I thought, I've thought all of the above, but really the best thing I learned is first of all, I had to forgive myself. I had to stop blaming myself and feeling guilty and feeling shame. And then just every day do my best to be a good parent to Emily, who was by then an adult. I mean, you know, when all of our troubles began, she was an adult. Mm -hmm. And I, my heart really goes out to parents whose kids split wide open when they're teenagers. And those parents are legally liable and responsible, or trying to be responsible. And it's that would be that would be really, really scary. Very, very scary. Mm -hmm. And that wasn't, thank goodness, that wasn't the case for me. Mm -hmm. So you learning that like you didn't cause this for her that you could, you know, did that come through working your own 12 step program? I knew nothing about AA. I knew nothing about alcoholism, you know, other than movies, you know, that sort of thing. I grew up in env an environment that if there was anything wrong in a family, you did not talk about it. Don't air your dirty laundry in public, right? Isn't that the same? Exactly. Saying? Exactly. It's taboo. It's uh, uncomfortable. It's... Yes. And that, that would go for anything. Uh, a divorce, any kind of a, a disease like... Mental uh, illness. <laughs> Sorry. Mental illness, you know, anything, if it was negative, man, we circled the wagons and did not talk about it, did not talk about it, which is so destructive. So, yeah, so destructive. for sure. I can only imagine going through that and then feeling like you have to go through it alone because you can't tell anyone. Right. I remember... Uh, being at a family reunion. And by this time, Emily was well into her recovery and living uh, in a sober living. And we are sitting, a bunch of us are sitting at lunch. And one of my first cousins says to Emily, <laughs> so Emily, tell me, where are you living? And Emily said, I'm living at an Oxford house. It's a facility for people, for alcoholics who are early into their recovery. And it's, it's been a really good experience for me. I almost fell out of my chair. <laughs> Emily said it so matter of factly, so calmly, uh, and with poise. I mean, she said it very, very well. And I was horrified. <laughs> I was like, oh my God. <laughs> Don't tell people. <laughs> But hey, that was my truth. I, I lived in Oxford for three years. And if somebody asked me where I'm living, I mean, I could have just given them like, you know, I'm living in Dallas, but maybe that could be helpful to someone later. You know, I live in Oxford with nine other women who are <laughs> sober. Well, and I, I now I have total respect for the fact, Em, that you were not willing to accept any shame whatsoever mm. for where you were living. You were in a, you were having great success and you were on your road to recovery and you just, you weren't going to whitewash any of that. Yeah. I think I learned that at the Magdalene house. I was going to say, uh, so growing up in the family and like in the family dynamic that you did where people didn't talk about these things and, you know, how did you get to a point where you were so free to like be able to just like your mom just beautifully described just like matter of fact and with poise and all of that. I had to first go to four treatments, get step one, get a sponsor and work the steps quickly, like two weeks. Like I need to get through the 12 steps in two weeks or I will be drunk. And after that, you know, af after you get a, a, a few amends under your belt, you know, after you get on your knees, do your third step, after you start carrying the message, then it's like, oh, wait, I'm uniquely qualified to help women. Mm -hmm. I have something to offer. So why am I going to walk around with my head down ashamed and, and scared and embarrassed? 
I'm mm-hmm. an alcoholic, you know, that's my truth. So yeah, I, I had to work the steps before I could say that out loud. Mm-hmm without the shame and the stigma and the, oh my God, I'm going to embarrass my mother and I'm an alcoholic and the family and the black sheep. I'm, you know, damaged. And Did you feel at one time like you were the black sheep? Absolutely. Yes. And, and so did other members in our family. I mean, I had family members come up to me and say, well, I hope you don't think that that came from our side of the family. <laughs> yeah. And it doesn't uh, matter. It doesn't matter where it came. You know what I'm saying? Like it, that's, mm-hmm. it's, irre- it's irrelevant. It's not helpful for whatever reason. God chose me to be an alcoholic. Are you a loved one of an alcoholic? Our family support group serves as a community for friends, loved ones, and family members of alcoholics to learn about alcoholism understand how to help an alcoholic, and experience an improved quality of life, regardless of the alcoholic's recovery. We have weekly support meetings that meet virtually and in person, as well as a monthly speaker meeting. To find out more about our family support group, visit magdalenhouse.org slash family. So do you feel like the black sheep now? Sometimes, yes. Sometimes, yes. What do you do in situations? Because I'm just like thinking of like sponsees. That's like every time around Christmas time, there's always one or two sponsees that are calling because they're freaking out that they have to go back home and be around their family. And, you know, they're like all of that narrative that they tell themselves. So what do you do if that comes up for you? Or what would you say to a sponsee or or someone who's listening? Um, that way. Okay. What I would say to um, someone who's new in sobriety and recovery, those first birthday parties and that first Thanksgiving or that first Christmas or that first whatever family, stay really close to God. Double up on your 11th step, like prayer meditation big time. And sponsorship is so important. I remember the first Thanksgiving because I had just gotten out of Maggie's in October and we had, you know, Thanksgiving, of course, in November. And I was nervous. I was nervous because usually there's alcohol, you know, and here I am walking in a few weeks sober. I don't remember if I was totally through the work yet. And I remember calling Lee and being like, okay, you know, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to JB and Mary's. Um, I'm nervous, you know, this and that. And, uh, I don't remember exactly what she said, but the gist of it was Emily, the book says we go, we go to these places thinking of what we, what we can offer. How can I be helpful? Mm -hmm. She was like, go in the kitchen and ask, what can I do to be helpful? And that side of the family didn't, they didn't drink that year. And I remember asking my, my cousin who I adore, Jennifer, are you guys not drinking because of me? And she was like, yeah, we want to be supportive. And even that I felt kind of like, oh God, like like, I'm the reason you guys can't have a cocktail or drink your, you know, but that's not my call. You know, that was their decision. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, So yeah, it, the first one, the first one is hard. And then there's a lot of self involved. At least that was my experience, you know, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. after that, then it's just like your life. Then it's just like, well, cause I've been sober for six years and I'm sure some of this is just my own crap, but I don't like live with I, my, all of my family lives in Missouri and I live in Texas. And when I go, yeah, yeah. So whenever I, but when I go back home, like I always feel comfortable at my parents' house. Like that's, you know, like my mom and my stepdad, but like, I still get this feeling going around extended family. And I'm sure a lot of that is like self-centeredness. Like, ah, I'm the drug addict, alcoholic of the, because my uncle, he's struggling with alcoholism really bad. And my, my other uncle was like, well, no, he's not doing the stuff that you were doing because I was also doing drugs, but they don't realize that I'm also like very, I'm an alcoholic as well. Like I was also drinking. And so, so I still feel like, oh, I'm still that person in the family, even though, 
you know, like here, like I feel like completely like confident in who I am and I'm very, I live very out loud and all that stuff. But do you have like experience with like feeling that way around extended family or anything like that still? Does that ever still come up for you? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it does. I I can, you know, I can be around my family who, who likes to drink. And, mm-hmm. and that's, you know, fine. And I'm so glad that they want me around again, you know, yeah. but yeah, I, I do feel different sometimes. And sometimes, sometimes I'll have that fleeting thought of, you know what, it would be, it would be nice if I could, you know, have a glass of wine with the fam and not wind up in the hospital in a few minutes, <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> but I, I, I cannot, right. you know? Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think that's a normal thought or a feeling to have. And I, I, what, I'm sorry. Like I'm like that. I'm different. I'm different. I am different. You know, I mean, I I am different. Um, and I, and I'm honest with, you know, my sponsor about it and Lee will get me right back in the book and say, okay, now you go help somebody else get out of yourself. Mm -hmm. So Sue Ann, when, what motivated you to work the steps? Cause you've worked the steps, correct? Absolutely. Yes. And yes. what motivated you to do so? Because clearly what motivated Emily was she didn't want to drink again, but what, mo- what motivated you? I knew that I wanted to change the way that I thought and the way that I behaved toward my adult daughter. And I did not have the tools to do that on my own. I really needed that 12-step program to take me step by step through that. I, I, don't think, I don't think Emily and I would have a relationship to speak of if both of us had not gone through a recovery process. Amen. Amen. So what was your experience going through the steps, Miss Sue Ann? Well, as, as I said, I got this really hard-nosed sponsor who was a retired librarian and lived with uh, her sister, and her sister was an alcoholic. So my sponsor, I mean, man, she was hard line, man. <laughs> And she would, she and I would uh, meet uh, once a week and uh, I would get so nervous and overwrought about meeting with her, having lunch with her, showing her the work that I had done that week. I, I finally got to the point that I, I told her, I can't, I get so upset before I meet with you. We, we have to eliminate food because it, it's just, it gives me diarrhea. I, I get, I get really, really nervous. So, um, she, she said, that's fine. That's fine. But she was very, very exacting, pretty judgmental of me. And as I said, she was really hard line. She would say things, you know, she would ask me a question. I would tell her my feelings or how something had happened. And she would say, well, that's just ridiculous. I mean, that that was her reaction. So she was all in, in terms of me changing the way I thought and change, changing the way I behave. She said, you desperately need to do this. So I and so, did it to the best of my ability. And do you feel like you had a spiritual awakening? Do you feel like you changed in the process? Absolutely. Uh, yes, absolutely. And it's it's changed all of my relationships, to be real honest with you. On one hand, I'm much more um, tolerant of some characteristics of people that I love. On the other hand, I have slammed the door in my relationships with uh, several people because I considered what they were the way they were behaving toward me is destructive. It was destructive mm-hmm. to me. And so uh, why, why would I subject myself to that? Mm-hmm. So I just say, that's it. I'm sorry. That's it. I can't do this. Mm-hmm. Very inspiring, you know. And um, that's what, since I moved away from Dallas, I, I really wanted, I really wanted to, to create huge change in my life. I wanted a fresh start. Mm-hmm. So that's, that's what I did. And where do you live now? I live in Kansas City, Missouri in Brookside. Oh, okay. 
Mm, yeah. That's what you yeah, that's awesome. That's wonderful. Emily, what did your relationship with your mom look like when you got sober this last time? How did it look? Were you guys talking? Were you, what did that look like? Okay, so uh, I remember when I made amends to my mother and she was one of my first ones. She, she, when I said, what can I do to make this right? You know, I I regret all this. And um, she basically said, I I want you to be self-sufficient. I want you to be healthy. And uh, whether she said it or not, I, I, she wanted me to continue what I was doing. Does that ring true, Sue Ann? Yes, absolutely. Um, It did take a while. Eight years in, now me and Sue Ann talk at least once a week. Oh, Some, yeah. But like for a while, not so often. Right. I mean, we, we could go months without talking. And I, I remember when I was first sober, you know, and honestly, you know, the, the people that love us, right? If we're chronic relapsers, if you've been to multiple treatments, I mean, who can blame our family members and our loved ones for putting a little distance, a little space, right? Mm -hmm. Um, Waiting to see if it's going to stick, if we're going to stay sober. I remember getting a text from my mom saying, I haven't heard from you in a while, and that bothers me. And I remember being so uh, surprised, and, and I remember bouncing it off of Lee, and Lee told me, if your mom calls you and you're in a meeting or whatever, you you take her phone call. Like now that your mom is opening the door, you know, t- mm-hmm. to, to let you back in and wants to hear from you, you need to let her hear from you. Because a part of me, and this is self-pity, you know, and self, but a part of me was hurt and sad that she moved away, you know, like, oh, I'm a year sober and now you're going to move. But that's what she has to do to be happy. And to live her life that has nothing to do with me. Anyway, Lee Lee made it very clear. And I was like, why is my mom saying that it bothers her when she doesn't hear from me? And she was like, Emily. Sorry. No, it's very touching. Um... So it's it's changed to answer your question. And it took a while, you know, and me and my mom still bet heads sometimes. We did just recently on New Year's Eve. And then we had to circle back a few weeks later and talk about it. We had the weekend from hell. That's <laughs> basically yeah, it, it was rough. It was rough. <laughs> and it was a learning experience for everyone involved. Now we have the tools to like deal with it spiritually, you know, after we raise our voices. And, and both uh, of you guys have the tools. That's, I mean, that's amazing. You know? Yeah. I mean, we... <sighs> It's progress, not perfection, right? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. For so, me, when Emily was newly into re- her recovery, when I wouldn't hear from her, you know, it I would really have to go into self-control in order not for my brain to spin out of control. B- but I would not allow myself to call her because I would immediately go into my parent mode. You know, Mm -hmm. how are things at work? Have you paid your rent this month? You know, are you overdrawn at at the bank? You know, all of those awful. Control land, control land. (laughs) Yes. Yes. And so texting for me and Emily for a long time, texting um, was our method of communication. It, It was like a safety valve for both of us. You know, I would get a text from her that I wasn't necessarily happy with, but I could kind of sit on it for a while and think about it before I responded to it. And I feel sure that she felt the same way about some of the texts that she got from me. So I'm going to ask both of you this question, but Miss Sue Ann, when did you notice a change in Emily sober? Like, when did you notice that she was starting to change in a positive way? Um, really, the big thing was in her relationships with men. That was very different, very mm-hmm. different. Um, and I had learned enough by then that I could stand back and keep my hands off of asking her personal questions or being nosy 
or trying to be manipulative, which is my nature. <laughs> um, but yes, her relationships with, with men. That is disappointing <laughs> for me. To, I'm sorry. That, that's it? That's the biggest one? Sorry, um, it's your answer. It's your answer. Think, I'll stay out of it. It's relatable. Though. That, it's in so my relatable. mind, that answer is all-encompassing. I mean, that encompasses a lot of ground. I just, I know for me, like, I I think it's so common for women whenever we get here to have also this other thing, you know, this thing with men. And so I think that that's really probably relatable. And I'm just thinking of like my mom. Um, I've been thinking about my mom a lot during this whole thing. I'll probably call her when I get off the phone. I mean, get off with you guys. And I hope it this kind of does the same thing for our listeners, you know. I was just thinking of like all the crap that my mom had to see even before my drug addiction or alcoholism got, well, what I thought was bad. You know, she probably thought I had an alcohol problem way before I did, but right, anyway, right. Uh, you know, and a lot, and some, a lot of that stuff was relationships. Absolutely. Without, can I ask a question? Sue Ann? Okay. Okay. Oh, sure. Without names, what can you give me kind of in a nutshell? This this answer is fascinating to me. Can you give me like a specific relationship example thing where you were like, oh, she's different? Well, yes. The obvious one without naming any names uh-huh. was when your man du jour uh-huh. uh, relapsed yeah, yeah, and yeah. disappeared. Oh, yeah. Okay. Okay. And watching you deal with that was um, really inspiring to me because you behaved like an adult, a sober, fully functioning adult. And I thought, wow, look at this. Watch her go. How do you feel, Emily, knowing that like your mom was watching from afar and you probably had no idea that the way you were showing up was having that effect on her? How do you feel hearing that now? It gives me a lot of empathy for her it's interesting to be on the other side and i i know you know what i'm talking about stephanie Mm because even though you can be recovered and like drug addict alcoholic whatever when you love someone who's struggling with addiction it's like it's a game changer you know like i can talk a big game but then when someone you care about is disappears or you know is out it's a right I remember thinking like, oh my God, this, this is harder than, it's harder to be on this side than at least back then I was blacked out. Right. Like, right. No, it is. That's, I have heard people (laughs) say, and it's so true. Like we, at least we get to be drunk. Yeah. Yeah. So it means a lot to me, mom, to hear you say that. Well, you're, you are a completely different person, Emily. You have changed in so many ways since 2013, 2014. Thank God. Thank you. Yes. I will always be grateful for Lee. Lee is just an angel to me. Always will be. Shout out to Lee and Maggie's. Absolutely. Yes. And Maggie's. I loved, loved, loved Maggie's. Well, thank you guys for, for doing this. Emily, when did you see that your mom was different? Yeah. Did you see differences in me, Emily? Absolutely. Yeah. Well, I mean, of course I saw when you started setting boundaries, you know, I saw That's that. What, hold on real quick. Sorry to interrupt, yeah, but of course, Miss Sue Ann, the reason why I asked Emily about this was because when she was telling her story, she mentioned how she saw a difference in you because you had started Alan on or something. And so like, I reached out to her right away and I was like, can I interview the both of you? And yeah. So, but she anyway, had, she had started that. setting boundaries from, from that first rehab, the first or second one. Like, so what's the plan? Where are you going to go? And then my last trip to Maggie's, I remember, I remember she came on whatever day you could visit. Right. And she, she looked me right in the eye and she said, "M, this is the last time. I'm coming to visit you in rehab. And she didn't say it like spiteful, vindictive, like to her. She was just saying, this is, this is the last time I'm coming. And then watching my mom sponsor women in Al-Anon, that that's pretty cool. 
that's real cool because she found this purpose and this thing that now she's uniquely qualified to help other women, you know, and, Mm -hmm. and that's, that's cool. So that was a big difference too. And I, I remember once, this was years ago, you know, one of my big fears, even today, is f- I have financial fear, right? And I I was working at a pizza place and I was like down to like 10 or 11 bucks in my account. And I remember uh, I was talking to my mom and I was like, I, I have $10 until payday. And she said, oh, well, you know, that'll be plenty. That'll be plenty to get you through payday. And I was like, right on, like boundaries, <laughs> Al-Anon, good for you, you know. <laughs> Were you hoping she'd be like, oh, honey, I'll give you I mean, that. I knew Lee wouldn't let me. Lee was like, you are not in the business to ask your mother for anything, you know. But for her to say that, again, real spiritually, well, $10 should be enough for a few days, you know, if you have, if you have gas in your tank and you have, you know, and I, I remember thinking, good for you because she's healthy. She's taking care of her and she has her connection with her higher power. Right. And, you know, does her big book study. And, and it was like, you're not my responsibility. I mean that in a good way though, you know, no, no, but I'm watching you right now talk and I hear someone who's very, very proud of their mom. I'm so proud of her. I'm so proud of her. And I'm so glad, I'm so grateful that we can be in each other's lives the way that we are now. Like truly it's, it's because of this program. Truly. Absolutely. Absolutely. Hmm. So you made amends to your mom, Miss Sue Ann, did you make an amends to Emily? Did they have you do that in Al-Anon? I never made formal amends to Emily. I, I would do, take it in smaller steps. I remember we had one conversation once. I, I really told her that I felt I had let her down terribly in the way I had parented her, which was the way I was parented. Um, I think I did a lot of damage and that I, I guess that's one of the things that I feel the worst about is you know, there's just no manual for parents, and it just depends on the child and the circumstance. And if I had it to do over again, I would parent Emily differently. And maybe different. I would still wind up a raging alcoholic. <laughs> well, that whether or not you're an alcoholic may is beside the point. Okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, I I want to say to you have maybe not formal amends like big book uh, outline, but like there's been some text messages too that mm-hmm. that my mother has sent. I can think of and a that- hand a handful of them where it's like, "Hey, I regret this, and I'm sorry about this." And when I read them, I'm like, "Oh my god!" Like, <laughs> yeah, I don't know if you know what I'm talking about, Mom, but I I remember oh, them. No. I'm not sure what you're talking about. Well, there was one specifically after you watched an episode of Mom. Oh. (laughs) And you sent me a very long text about what was happening in the episode and how you were sorry you couldn't da 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 da. So. Right. For for me, and Em, I hope you don't mind me telling this because this is really this is really close to the bone. For me, when Emily was seven years old and I knew that she was very depressed and very troubled and I did not know how to access that. I didn't, I didn't know what to do. And we had come home one day, you know, normal routine. We had come home from work and from school and Emily found me in the house and she said, mom, when you stopped loving dad, he died. Are you going to stop loving me? Will I die? And that, I mean, that I hit the wall that that was, I went into panic mode. Then I started finding the best therapist I could find. And that's therapy how we, time. Yeah. <laughs> that's when we wound up with Tammy. But I thought, oh my God, you know, talk about a cry for help. I just experienced one from my only child. My only child is begging me for help. So, yeah. I mean, I that was probably very, very hard. 
the heart i mean the hardest thing i think in the world is being a mom and like wanting so bad to do your best and like knowing like you're still making mistakes and like having this like powerlessness and my kids are only three and 13 you know and and then I hear stories like what you just described Miss Suyan and then like moms who have to deal with you know Isaac's mom for instance Isaac is Wesley's dad who died you know and like parents who've had to walk through tragedy like that and seeing people like you Miss Suyan and other parents that I've interviewed and to hear the way how they were able to walk through things and it's so I think is so inspiring and hearing the way that like you handled that with Emily at age seven, I think is well I think it's really I tell you it's only inspiring in the rear view mirror. Right. (laughs) (laughs) At the time it is just rip your guts out. You know, even I I remember Emily when she was probably 11 or 12 years old and she and I were having a conversation about something and she she said mom how long is it gonna hurt will it ever stop hurting and I you know it broke my heart because I couldn't fix it right I could I could not fix it mm-hmm and um and that's what you want to do when you see your child hurting all you want to do is fix it right well mm-hmm. and and feel guilty and uh full of shame because oh. you played a part in creating the nightmare that your kid had to live through so yeah it's a world of hurt it is but i'm not a mom but it's i don't think it's anyone's i don't think anyone has all the answers or has all the solutions that's not it's not reality that's not exactly ideally sure you could take all the pain away and have all the answers and fix everything but that's we're we're just one person (laughs) we're just one person and for Mm -hmm. me now when i hear someone say oh i had an idyllic childhood i you know lived in a perfect town i went to a perfect school i had perfect friends my parents had a perfect marriage I just look at them and smile and nod and think, oh, my God, you <laughs> you are so in denial. Yeah. Or maybe they did, Mom. Maybe they had a totally different experience. Takes all kinds. I, well, I, I, I agree. It takes all kinds. But I don't I don't believe that exists. I honestly, I now believe none of us come out of our childhood unscathed. None of us do. We're all going to have scars and wounds and character defects sorry to interrupt Mm -hmm. and character defects Mm -hmm. that we will carry through into adulthood and it's our life's work to have god remove them (laughs) yes to do our best to to leave that behind to set Mm -hmm. that baggage down and go help somebody else exactly that's in worse shape than you are yes so in that Emily, I know you're really proud of your mom, not only for the work that she's done, but the women that she has helped. So, man, do you want to talk about your experience with, with helping others? I, When I first moved to Kansas City, I considered it to be very important to uh, get involved in an Al-Anon group here because I really needed the support. So I began attending and found a great group that was conveniently located and then I was attending that regularly and then COVID hit and any other crisis time people families started having big time problems and so the administrators of the groups that I went to contacted me and said would you be willing we we need to organize some more AA groups and some more Al-Anon groups. And would you be willing to be a part of that? And I said, sure, as long as I'm not doing it totally by myself. I I would co-lead. I'm happy to sponsor someone. I think I'm ready for that. But as far as leading a group week in and week out, I'm not sure I'm up to that. I have the knowledge for that. So that's what I began doing was co-leading an Al-Anon group here in Kansas City. And I began sponsoring women. I, I prefer sponsoring women to men. And it's been, a, it's been a positive experience for the most part. That's awesome. I think Emily has a big smile on her face. 
You know, it's yeah. uh, one thing that it just always makes me smile and laugh because I go through it with every mom that I am sponsoring, enabling. Oh my God. It's just in our DNA to enable the person that we love. We, we want to help them so desperately. You know, that's that's a, a big, big booger bear that as a sponsor in Al-Anon, you've got you've to jump on quick. Why do you think that is? Like, why do you think moms have such a problem enabling? Because I do, and I don't even have, like I said, my kids are three and 13, and I, like, I enable my son and my daughter sometimes. So why, like, why do you think that is that we have such a hard time with that? I, I think it's just part of our makeup as a feminine person. You're the that, nurturers, you're the caretakers, exactly. you're to meet their needs, you know, it's, and then they awesome. start growing up and then it's, again, I'm not a mom. I'm just saying like, but no, all of those things you just said, Emily, are very true. Your kids so, go to you for, for help or answers and to help get their needs met, whether it's, you know, whatever it is. And I kind of goes against the nature to say no. Yeah. I see with that. Yeah, I can see that for sure. Well, I have had you guys on here for quite a while now. So I'm going to wrap this up for you both. But this has been absolutely lovely. I've shed a few tears myself. And I really do think that this is going to be very helpful. But Emily, I want to ask you the final question If you could say one thing from the alcoholic's perspective to a mom who's struggling, what would you want her to hear from the alcoholic's perspective? That this isn't your fault. And I would encourage moms to get the help and support they may not think that they need, but could help benefit their relationship with their child and with everybody else. But most of all, the, the shame and the stigma and all that. It's not your fault. It's not your fault. Your kid's an addict or alcoholic. It's just not. Well, well, I think throughout this interview, what has come across is a mother and daughter who have a lot of love and respect for one another. And I think that that came across very strongly on whether or not the questions were act, asked like, ro- you know, robotically or whatever, but you guys both did such a great job of sharing your stories of like what it was like what happened and what it's like today and the love and respect for you that you have for one another definitely came across for sure sue ann is there anything that you would want to leave a mom with before we go or anything you want to say to one another before we go i would like to encourage moms everywhere that are having to deal with a child a a a kid who uh, has addictions is, you know, it's, it's a process and it is one day at a time, one situation at a time, one conversation at a time. And as Emily said, you need a lot of support as a parent to make it through successfully. And I would encourage any mom, any parent that's dealing with a kid with an addiction to get, to get help to get support get a sponsor work the steps that's yeah. right absolutely thank you both miss sue ann and emily and to all of our listeners this was fantastic i really thank you so it. much stephanie we appreciate thank you, you so stephanie. much enjoyed meeting you 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 too bye 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 this has been a re-release from the magdalene house podcast for our from the vault series we hope you've enjoyed this podcast Tune in every Wednesday for a new release from one of our four series. To learn more about the Magdalene House and the services we offer, visit magdalenehouse.org or follow us on your favorite social media channels.